We have manufacturing locations, um, two here in Kalamazoo. We have a uh, location in Poland. We have three locations in Texas. We've been in the metal scrap handling business since 1950. We have some of the most experienced chip processing engineers and conveyor engineers anywhere. Today, I want to introduce to you the latest in modular chip system technology. My name is Ron Chapman, System Sales Manager at Prab, globally headquartered in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Let's begin. Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media Webinar. Our topic is applying the latest metal chip processing technology to improve EHS compliance and drive cost reduction. Hello, I'm Bill Koenig, a senior editor at Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. Before we begin, I'd like to provide some background on what we will be doing today. Our sponsor is Prab Incorporated, a global company that continually works to find better ways to move and process materials. This webinar will address the importance of analyzing your operation's risk and opportunity as it relates to chip and fluid processing in a world where manufacturing is rapidly and dramatically changing. You will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears at the right of your screen. Time permitting, these will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. This presentation includes video, and as with any video played over the internet, there can be problems depending on how you link to the internet and how much demand is placed on your bandwidth during the presentation. So if you do have problems or questions about the workings of this presentation, or any aspect of Advanced Manufacturing Media's webinars, please let us know via the Q&A box, or you can email me at bkoenig at sme.org. I'll rejoin you after the presentation with a few concluding remarks. The presenter for this webinar is Ron Chapman, a mechanical engineer with PRAB. Ron has more than 35 years of advanced industrial automation systems engineering and consulting experience. He works as a consultant with companies in metalworking manufacturing to help them meet EHS and ISO 14001 requirements through scrap metal collection and processing and fluid retention, recovery, and recycling. Here's Ron Chapman. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, everyone, for participating in the webinar this afternoon. In today's discussion, we're going to be reviewing three primary topics. First, has your company initiated an environmental compliance assessment or has your company adopted an environmental compliance policy? Secondly, have you identified the areas in your plant where environmental health or safety risk can be mitigated? And finally, have you considered implementing the latest technology and processes to help mitigate these risks and support your environmental sustainability initiative. Processes and technology that will meet or exceed health and safety requirements will be reviewed today. <clears throat> Initiating an environmental sustainability protocol can help mitigate risk and shield yourself against potential fluid disposal liabilities. Let me give you an example. One risk associated with chips and turnings that are laden with free liquid can be a liability should a lawsuit be filed against a recycler that disposes of hazardous materials improperly. Remember that the manufacturer is still at risk of fines and penalties even though the metal and coolant waste have been removed from site by the recycler. The more used coolant or machining oil a manufacturer sends to the recycler the greater the chance of being implicated if disposal problems should arise. By proactively addressing fluid and chip remediation, manufacturers can help shield themselves from a li uh, liability by pro proving good intent. So, even though you may not presently have a policy in place, your minimum requirement should be 
to map out an effective environmental policy using ISO 14001 as a baseline is a good recommendation. <clears throat> now, if you don't have an environmental policy, even though it's recommended, a manufacturer can identify areas in their plant where material savings and environmental improvements can be immediately realized. Remember, ISO 14001 does not state requirements for environmental performance, but maps out a framework that a company or organization can follow to set up an effective environmental management system. It can provide assurance to company management and employees, as well as external stakeholders, that environmental impact is being measured and improved. The benefits of using ISO 14-1000 compliance are these. Reduce cost of waste management, savings in consumption of energy and materials, improved corporate image among regulators, customers, employees, and yes, the general public. Let me give you an example. Reclaiming scrap metal and recycling processes would be one of the first areas you would want to assess in any manufacturing facility. Additional areas to target would include grinding, honing applications, cleaning processes, and even your current wash and mop water recycling practices. Again, today, an obvious place to begin an environmental health and safety assessment is at the point where scrap metal and coolant waste are generated. We'll be focusing primarily around a company's machining operations, which would include screw machines, gantry mills, CNC lays, and of course drills. Here you can see turnings exiting a typical CNC laid operation. Depending upon the machining operation, material type, spindle speeds, etc., the metal scrap can exit a machine in a chip-like condition, or in this case, a very large, tangly, nested wad of material. You can imagine this nested wad presents its own share of problems. For example, material will transfer up the conveyor and into the cart or self-dumping hopper, but once the container fills, the material can catch on the belt itself and carry back into its return. This can cause the conveyor to stop or can jam the conveyor chain and break the belt. If the material jams, and most generally it will, the wad will need to be pulled out by the operator or maintenance personnel. This is certainly is, not, is a safety concern and not a desirable situation as some materials like nickel alloys, cast alloys, nickel alloys, and stainlesses can cut hands even through proper approved safety glove use. In this one area alone is where we'd be focusing much of our attention today. With technology where it is, there is equipment available, however, that can remedy this ongoing safety issue, and we'll look at this shortly. But first, let's look at a typical plant illustration that shows how many companies are managing their coolant and scrap metal waste off their CNC operations. This illustration shows a basic CNC machining operation. With the CNCs in place, you'll see that the material exits the machine via a hinge steel belt conveyor and is collected in self-dumping hoppers or chip carts. But this method of handling, I'm sure you know, has its own safety concerns with slippery floors, messy plant conditions, and as we saw in the previous slide, unmanageable turnings. For these reasons alone, it's becoming an undesirable way of handling and transferring waste materials. To help reach ISO 14001 compliance by eliminating cutting fluid and metal waste from accumulating on plant floors, the trend now is for companies to implement in-floor or even above floor 
chip and fluid transfer systems. As you can see by this illustration, material can be collected and transferred beneath the floor through a network of harpoon style conveyors. The conveyors are placed in a pit where utilities can also be run, including coolant lines. Or if you can't cut into your plant floor, another efficient method of transfer is a negative pressure scrap evac system. These pneumatic systems quickly evacuate chips and coolant from the point of generation and transfer the waste through an overhead pipe to a central chip processing and coolant recovery area. Since it's a negative pressure or vacuum system, coolants cannot drip on the floor and are carried effectively downstream to final processing. Let's look at these two transfer methods a little bit closer. So from obsolete chip cart collection and transfer, the trend now is to simply move the waste streams through an in-floor harpoon style conveyor This is an effective, economical, and very, very low maintenance method of handling. A simple reciprocating ram design is used to move product down the length of the conveyor, again, with fluid, with chips, with turnings. Whatever goes in that conveyor will go out. It will move the material and coolant to the end of the system down to the processing line. By implementing a network of conveyors, this type system can accommodate most any layout. Here we are running coolant at approximately 1200 GPM with chips turnings. Again, the conveyor will handle, let me go back a slide. The conveyor will handle any type of material, including stringers, turning, wads of scrap. The, the truck can receive and convey flooded coolant from a bank of machines with efficiency. It can be sloped slightly or sloped not at all making the invert dimension at the end or the discharge pit depth much shallower than a comparable velocity or sluice trench design. Again, the mechanical movement with strategic barred placement ensures that all nested material will transfer forward and not block the trough. Back to this illustration of, how, of our basic CNC machining operations. At the discharge of the CNC conveyors, you can implement an, an above floor collection and transfer method to collect the chips and waste fluids. Again, this may be preferred if trenches cannot be dug in the plant for an in-floor system. The vacuum system may be preferred, especially if there's a possibility the CNC machines would be moving in the future, as it's easy to add additional inlets or reposition the pneumatic piping not the case when considering an in-floor system. Here, a company in upstate New York installed a bank of seven discharge conveyors with vacuum inlets off their star CNC machines. Their enviro environmental sustainability initiative mandated that no metal chips cutting or lubricating oils generate, generated by the manufacturing processes be present on the plant floor. Again, this company runs very heavy cutting fluid, but the plant is as clean as you would see in any pharmaceutical facility. In fact, employees as well as visitors are required to wear foot coverings in all machining areas. And you can see by this plant picture just how well the machine is, the plant is kept and clean. This is a video 
of a typical CNC discharge with coolant and ship evacuation. As you can see here, wands can be placed nearby the vacuum inlet, making it convenient to help clean around the machining area. In this video, I simply placed a wand in the inlet and shoveled material in to show how efficient the evac system really is. Even when presented with a high percentage of waste coolants and chips, the evac system works extremely well. Material simply enters, I'm going to go back to another side. Yeah, the slide right here shows that the material simply enters the inlet and is evacuated through the overhead piping to the central chip and fluid collection area. The chip and coolant waste is in the piping for just a few seconds. If for any reason the evac system was down, you could simply add a bypass shed plate at the discharge of the CNC to divert the material into a cart or self-dumping hopper until inspection or repairs can be made. You may want to keep in mind that these inlets work independently, so if one evac inlet goes down, they're not all down. From the, po from the vacuum pickup points, the material passes through a coalescing style cyclone and ringer system. The run material is then blown through the wall to an outside 1,500 cube cubic foot silo for holding dry material. Load cells monitor the silo fill weight when the silo reaches a full condition. A call is then placed to the recycler automatically through Ethernet communication and a truck is scheduled for pickup. An interesting benefit with the implementation of a silo system is that the material is completely secure. There is no risk of the material being stolen or unaccounted for. On the other end, captured oil is collected in the ringer recovery tank. The arrow at the bottom is pointing to the fluid tank itself. When the recovered fluid reaches a certain level in the tank, it is pumped through a filtration system and then sent back to the machines on demand for reuse. All I can say is this system is a perfect example of a cradle-to-grave ISO 14001 environmentally friendly system. It is completely hands-off, zero handling of the material from point of scrap generation to the dry chip storage silo, complete with coolant recovery and filtration. So let's briefly go back to the front end of the system. As you recall in a previous slide, with, with technology where it is today, the trend now is to reduce the material prior to entering the hopper at the discharge of the CNC. This is accomplished by adding a shredder or crusher unit at the discharge of the CNC conveyor. The shredder or crusher will reduce the material for transfer and for further processing. This reduction process is obviously required if we're going to feed a vacuum inlet receiver, as we just reviewed. Implementing a reduction process is definitely a valued-added benefit in that it lessens the frequency of handling and transfers full hoppers. It eliminates safety issues around the machine. It prevents the risk of material from belt damage and jamming. And reduces scrap, reduced scrap commands a higher value because the recycler is not hauling away a container filled with turnings and mostly air, but optimized full container weights at 40,000 pounds. Here is a brief video of the horizontal shredder system. I had our guys out in the shop feed a unit. Again, not, not safety issue by any means, 
this is not something you want to do. But of course, what I wanted to illustrate here is just how effective this machine is coming off your CNC conveyor. The material reduces quite easily and gets it down to a thumbnail size or less chip profile. It doesn't matter if you feed stainlesses, hardened steels, ink and L's, half toys, whatever, it will digest this material and do it quite effectively. Again, if in-floor or above-floor chip system is not within your budget, you can still implement a metal chip processing system for scrap volume reduction and or coolant recovery. Chip carts or hoppers can be transferred manually or by forklift to a central chip processing area. With processing today, the, the trend is modularity. And what I mean by this is the system is designed to take up the least amount of space possible and is completely pre-wired and ready to move in. Shown here is a mid to high volume system and it fits into an 8 foot by 20 foot area. Real estate is expensive. As shown, the material can be reduced by passing through a crusher shredder system if necessary. This will turn the material into a shovel grade consistency for further processing through the ringer unit. The centrifuge or chip ringer will remove upwards of 98% of the free liquids from the material. This is accomplished through centrifugal force as up to 700 G's of force is applied to the chip surfaces. Extracting the coolant and discharging a chip that has a moisture content of less than 2%. The dry material can then be sent pneumatically or by, gra um, or by gravity to an outside loadout station. Larger modular designs using redundant ringer systems, way belts, complete platforming, and custom loadout arrangements make for easy maintenance. This particular system was for a tier one automotive supplier and had four modulars, uh, four modules. A material would be moving from right to left, I'm sorry, from left to right in this slide. Module one is a five yard live bottom screw and surge hopper arrangement, beginning again at the infeed or left side of the slide. Module two is a dual ringer module for fluid extraction located in the center. Module three is actually a way belt and an incline drag conveyor. And then finally module four to the right is an overhead distribution drag that evenly distributes the processed chips over a, a lugger box or a large open top container or even a uh, open top trailer as well. The box or trailer, which are not shown in this photo, simply park under the distribution conveyor superstructure. At the core of every chip processing system is the ringer itself. And over the past eight to 10 years, I would say, there has been a vast improvement in ringer technology. Here we see two horizontal ringers sitting side by side. Horizontal or diagonal shaft ringers have superior benefits to the old vertical shaft design. These ringers empty easily. There is no material left in the bowl, which is critical on shutdown or restarts. These two designs minimize cross-contamination problems, if that, if that is truly an issue for you. Easily assessed front door panels expose the entire inside for ease of maintenance. The doors simply hinge forward. With this ringer arrangement, each ringer can run independently or together with split flows. Keep in mind, along with the cutting fluids, ringers are extracting whey oils, lubricants, which can be removed later in the process through liquid solid and liquid liquid filtration system. A back access portal is critical for visual inspection. Now, let me go back. A back access portal is critical for visual inspection and can even be used for rebalancing should that be required. 
External drive assemblies are easily maintained. Bearings and grease points are on the outside of the machine. The unit has very low DBA ratings, well within OSHA standards. These ringers are designed with a no leak guarantee. And when you think about it, a ringer is designed to extract fluid, not spew captured fluid all over the plant floor so much for ISO 14001 compliance. Finally, they're very low maintenance as the 24-7 design includes heavy-duty manganese bowls, liners, covers. In fact, the latest designs now have available high-wear stainless with self-cleaning stainless steel wedge wire as a standard component. Again, a very vast impu uh, improvement over old technology. Just a quick side note here. We're seeing more and more applications where customers are wanting to use uh, wash and rinse um, equipment to wash and rinse their material. This can be done by passing the material through a batch or continuous washer system, and by simple retention and heat, we're able to remove uh, any residual oils or carbon content off the material surfaces. The clean material can then be dewatered, dried, and sent back to remelt or a secondary remelting facility. Spent washer and rinse waters are captured and passed through a vacuum filter to remove heavy particulate and then sent to an ultrafiltration system for final cleaning. Processed fluids along with some makeup water is then sent back to the rinse and wash stages for reuse. Another trend today is to utilize briquetter systems to meet environmental compliance. By incorporating dual compaction technology that is two opposing cylinders, Material is squeezed to a die using high compressive force. We can go anywhere from 30 to 60,000 PSI face pressure with these briquetter systems. The material is pushed into the die and compressed into a near solid, what I would call, hockey puck. With dual compression uh, technology, the average puck density is 85 to 90 percent solid. The advantages to dual compaction include higher volume reduction using opposing cylinders, maximizing recovery of waste oils or coolants, reduction in hazardous waste handling costs, and then briquetted, briquetted material generally commands a higher price as fines can also be briquetted, briquetted. This is particularly true if you're running aluminum material. And then finally, dual compression technology is an excellent solution for remelting re applications because it produces the highest percentage of near solid available today. With dual compression uh, style briquetters, they have a superior hydraulic design and are also modular, making them very easy to fit into a layout and very easy to install. Another area which should be environmentally assessed is that of grinding swarf. With the latest improvements in both extruder and briquetter technology, it's now possible to compress the swarf using either of these two methods. You can expect to reclaim upwards of 95% of the spent fluids. Again, this is an area where you should be conducting an environmental audit, as companies generally pay a substantial fee to send this waste to landfill. Why? Because swarf is considered a hazardous waste. Just a few years ago, this technology was not available, but now with the flexibility in design and improvements made in compression chambers, cylinder timing, hydraulic design, and using high wear materials, this can be a huge opportunity for you to implement an environmental solution. After the cutting fluids have been reclaimed by bringing or by ringing or compressing, the next obvious consideration is to implement a coolant recycling or filtration system. You should be striving to eliminate the problems that occur when trap oils, suspended solids are allowed to accumulate in coolant or wash water systems. Properly designed filtered coolant systems remove free floating and mechanically dispersed trap oils, fine particulate, tool debris, etc., from individual sumps 
central systems, and wash tanks. Filtration systems remove tramp oils, extend tool life, provide a higher quality part for you, lower maintenance costs, and reduce coolant purchases overall. Ultra filtration systems extend the life of wash water, rinse water, floor scrubbing solution, synthetic coolants and pressure wash solutions by controlling oil and solids content. U.S. systems are also used for disposal of waste coolants and oily waste waters to help meet zero manifest manifesting goals and comply with federal, state, and local environmental regulations. U.S. filtrations can reduce oily wastewater volumes by as much as 95 to 98 percent. Some time ago, studies were conducted by the Machine Tool Industry Research Association. The study found that properly filtered fluids used on milling, drilling, grinding, and gear cutting equipment showed substantial improvement in increased tool life. Drills, the tool life was up 209 percent. Reamers were up 26%. Form tools, 66%. Turning tools, 78%. Boring, 20, 47%. Surface finish improvements on an average of 27% or more. And then machine downtime and resharpening costs, 50% reduction. Before we conclude this webinar, I wanted to try to illustrate to you quantitatively how much waste coolant you could expect to recover and the increased value when implementing processing equipment. I recently was at an uh, aerospace manufacturing plant where they were milling wing spars for the 777 aircraft. The wing spar block started out in a 9,000 pound block. After machining the block, the final spar actually weighed only 100 pounds. That's 90% of the material as scrap. Now with their combined machining off their gantry mills and mag-3 machines, we calculate as a, a scrap waste volume of about 2,000 pounds per hour. If we figure 20% of the scrap volume is coolant, that's 400 pounds per hour of coolant or 50 gallons per hour of reclaimed fluid or 600 gallons in a two shift operation. Of course, this would be three shifts. Uh, three shifts would represent 1,200 gallons per day of recovered fluid. 1,200 gallons per day of recovered diluted coolant. Even if the coolant has a dilution rate of 8%, this would still represent nearly 100 gallons per day of recovered full fluid concentrate. If we use the same 2,000 pound an hour example, the value of the scrap will also improve since the material is absent of free liquid. At 2,000 pounds per hour of volume, we would be processing and recovering 160,000 pounds a week or 640,000 pounds per month of scrap metal. With rung aluminum chips, for example, you would expect to see at least two cents per pound more of increased revenue, and that would be 544,000 pounds or $10,880 per month of added revenue for processed chips or $27,200 per, uh, per month for briquetted chips or for briquetted material, as you can expect to get five cents per pound more uh, for briquetted material. Implementing an environmental sustainability policy is truly a win-win scenario for everyone. It's a win-win for the scrap company because they are hauling scrap away without the risk of contaminating the roadways and environment, plus they're hauling fuller loads less frequently. And finally, it's a huge win for the manufacturing company as it strives to meet environmental compliance. 
plus the improvements that have been made mitigate risk while adding substantial profits to the company's bottom line. Again, thank you for spending your time with us today and listening to this presentation. Hello, this is Bill Koenig joining you again. Thank you, Ron, for that very inform informative session. We have received some questions and would be nice to get to all of them before our time is up. But let's start with these. Ron, first, what is the ISO? ISO is simply the International Organization for Standardization. It's simply a map by which the environmental compliances have set as a standard protocol. So that simply means International Organization for Standards. Okay. How do you deal with rancid, rancid coolants? Well, that's a good question. Um, one, one benefit, which actually I failed to mention uh, in my presentation, is that by implementing a filtration system, you could expect to eliminate odors produced from rancid coolant. Um, and also not, not just that, but it also reduces the dermatitis outbreaks that may be present in your facility as well. Okay. Have you had any, have you had experience with the sheet metal scrap? With sheet metal scrap, yes we have. Um, we do, there are a lot of uh, systems out there that use dye, dye lubes and this type of thing on stamping applications whereby that fluid is also collected and reclaimed for reuse. It can also be filtered. Okay. Um, what percentage uh, decline of coolant disposal costs can customers expect? It would not be, it would not be surprising uh, for, to reduce uh, your, your, co your coolant disposal costs by as much as 50, even 90%. And again, that's, I know that's a big range, but it depends on the application and, and particularly it's, it's plant specific but we've seen it as high as 90%. Okay. Can the EVAC system be used when no cutting fluid is used? We have manufacturing locations, um, two here in Kalamazoo. We have a uh, location in Poland. We have three locations in Texas. We've been in the metal scrap handling business since 1950. We have some of the most experienced chip processing engineers and conveyor engineers anywhere. Today, I want to introduce to you the latest in modular chip system technology. My name is Ron Chapman, System Sales Manager at Prab, globally headquartered in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Let's begin. Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media webinar. Our topic is applying the latest metal chip processing technology to improve EHS compliance and drive cost reduction. Hello, I'm Bill Koenig, a senior editor at Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. Before we begin, I'd like to provide some background on what we will be doing today. Our sponsor is Prab Incorporated, a global company that continually works to find better ways to move and process materials. This webinar will address the importance of analyzing your operations risk and opportunity as it relates to chip and fluid processing in a world where manufacturing is rapidly and dramatically changing. You will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears at the right of your screen. Time permitting, these will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. This presentation includes video and, as with any video played over the Internet, there can be problems depending on how you link to the Internet, 
and how much demand is placed on your bandwidth during the presentation. So if you do have problems or questions about the workings of this presentation or any aspect of advanced manufacturing media's webinars, please let us know via the Q&A box or you can email me at bkoenig at sme.org. I'll rejoin you after the presentation with a few concluding remarks. The presenter for this webinar is Ron Chapman, a mechanical engineer with PRAP. Ron has more than 35 years of advanced industrial automation systems engineering and consulting experience. He works as a consultant with companies in metalworking manufacturing to help them meet EHS and ISO 14001 requirements through scrap metal collection and processing and fluid retention, recovery, and recycling. Here's Ron Chapman. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, everyone, for participating in the webinar this afternoon. In today's discussion, we're going to be reviewing three primary topics. First, has your company initiated an environmental compliance assessment, or has your company adopted an environmental compliance policy? Secondly, have you identified the areas in your plant where environmental health or safety risk can be mitigated? And finally, have you considered implementing the latest technology and processes to help mitigate these risks and support your environmental sustainability initiative? Processes and technology that will meet or exceed health and safety requirements will be reviewed today. <clears throat> Initiating an environmental sustainability protocol can help mitigate risk and shield yourself against potential fluid disposal liabilities. Let me give you an example. One risk associated with chips and turnings that are laden with free liquid can be a liability should a lawsuit be filed against a recycler that disposes of hazardous materials improperly. Remember that the manufacturer is still at risk of fines and penalties even though the metal and coolant waste have been removed from site by the recycler. The more used coolant or machining oil a manufacturer sends to the recycler, the greater the chance of being implicated if disposal problems should arise. By proactively addressing fluid and chip remediation, manufacturers can help shield themselves from liability by proving good intent. So, even though you may not presently have a policy in place, your minimum requirement should be to map out an effective environmental policy using ISO 14001 as a baseline is a good recommendation. <clears throat> now, if you don't have an environmental policy, even though it's recommended, a manufacturer can identify areas in their plant where material savings and environmental improvements can be immediately realized. Remember, ISO 14001 does not state requirements for environmental performance, but maps out a framework that a company or organization can follow to set up an effective environmental management system. It can provide assurance to company management and employees, as well as external stakeholders, that environmental impact is being measured and improved. The benefits of using ISO 14000 compliance are these. Reduce cost of waste management, savings in consumption of energy and materials, improved corporate image among regulators, customers, employees, and yes, the general public. Let me give you an example. Reclaiming scrap metal and recycling processes would be one of the first areas you would want to assess in any manufacturing facility. Additional areas to target would include grinding, honing applications, cleaning processes, and even your current wash and mop water recycling practices. Again, today, an obvious place to begin an environmental health and safety assessment 
is at the point where scrap metal and coolant waste are generated. We'll be focusing primarily around a company's machining operations, which would include screw machines, gantry mills, CNC lays, and of course drills. Here you can see turnings exiting a typical CNC laid operation. Depending upon the machining operation, material type, the spindle speeds, etc., the metal scrap can exit a machine in a chip-like condition, or in this case, a very large, tangly, nested wad of material. You can imagine this nested wad presents its own share of problems. For example, material will transfer up the conveyor and into the cart or self-dumping hopper, but once the container fills, the material can catch on the belt itself and carry back into its return. This can cause the conveyor to stop or it can jam the conveyor chain and break the belt. If the material jams, and most generally it will, the wad will need to be pulled out by the operator or maintenance personnel. This is certainly is, not, is a safety concern and not a desirable situation as some materials like nickel alloys, cast alloys, nickel alloys, and stainlesses can cut hands even through proper approved safety glove use. In this one area alone is where we'd be focusing much of our attention today. With technology where it is, there is equipment available, however, that can remedy this ongoing safety issue, and we'll look at this shortly. But first, let's look at a typical plant illustration that shows how many companies are managing their coolant and scrap metal waste off their CNC operations. This illustration shows a basic CNC machining operation. With the CNCs in place, you'll see that the material exits the machine via a hinge steel belt conveyor and is collected in self-dumping hoppers or chip carts. But this method of handling, I'm sure you know, has its own safety concerns with slippery floors, messy plant conditions, and as we saw in the previous slide, unmanageable turnings. For these reasons alone, it's becoming an undesirable way of handling and transferring waste materials. To help reach ISO 14001 compliance by eliminating cutting fluid and metal waste from accumulating on plant floors, the trend now is for companies to implement in-floor or even above floor chip and fluid transfer systems. As you can see by this illustration, material can be collected and transferred beneath the floor through a network of harpoon style conveyors. The conveyors are placed in a pit where utilities can also be run, including coolant lines. Or if you can't cut into your plant floor, another efficient method of transfer is a negative pressure scrap evac system. These pneumatic systems quickly evacuate chips and coolant from the point of generation and transfer the waste through an overhead pipe to a central chip processing and coolant recovery area. Since it's a negative pressure or vacuum system, coolants cannot drip on the floor and are carried effectively downstream to final processing. Let's look at these two transfer methods a little bit closer. So from obsolete chip cart collection and transfer, the trend now is to simply move the waste streams through an in-floor harpoon style conveyor This is an effective, economical, and very, very low maintenance method of handling. A simple reciprocating ram design is used to move product down the length of the conveyor, again, with fluid, with chips, with turnings, whatever goes in that conveyor will go out. It will move the material and coolant to the end of the system down to the processing line. By implementing a network of conveyors, this type system can accommodate most any layout. Here we are running coolant at approximately 1,200 GPM with chips turnings.
Again, the conveyor will handle, let me go back a slide. The conveyor will handle any type of material, including stringers, turning, wads of scrap. The, the truck can receive and convey flooded coolant from a bank of machines.